The Warriors have officially been knocked out of the playoff conversation as they lost against the Sacramento Kings in the first round of the play-in. And boy, was it a really, really bad watch. As the Kings beat the Warriors 118-94, there's a lot of takeaway from this game, this season, and what exactly are the Warriors going to do moving forward. But I'm here to tell you, spoiler alerts! <laughs> The dynasty's over, dog. And trust me, I know we watch it live on playback.tv backslash Lowe's Room, where we're going to be watching every single game live throughout this postseason run, so make sure you go check me out over there. But Curry tonight held to 22 points, though he did shoot efficiently from the field behind the arc and got to the free throw line three times, made all three of them. But still, his level of impactfulness wasn't where it's normally at. Two assists, four rebounds, and turning the ball over six times really hurt this team immensely. And the reason for this is because Curry is really effectively the only player on the floor that could create for himself and others and honestly that has been an ongoing conversation not only for this entire season but also how they lost last year as well but what the rest of the team did really puts the nail in the coffin around the idea and the biggest problem with the golden state warriors wiggins being held to 12 points on 11 shot attempts kaminga putting up 16 points on 15 shot attempts b pod being held to five points in 24 minutes chris paul only shooting one for three from the field and the most noteworthy one was clay thompson going 0 for 10 from the field 0 for 6 from behind the arc and having a scoreless 31 minute game it was a horrifically bad terrible game and a must win situation for clay thompson and man it was really hard to watch that performance especially knowing what that could potentially mean for him moving forward there is a genuine question to be asked if this is the last time do we see the big three together out in the golden state warriors or are they going to bring back clay thompson because that has been the elephant in the room for the last like 18 months now but before we get into that a much bigger problem that we've seen all season long because there has been a lot first we have the curry conundrum or really just overly depending on a 36 year old who honestly just cannot carry this franchise for any longer throughout this entire season it was very prevalent and obvious that curry was going through a regression he had highs that looked really really good but also lows that left a lot of people concerned including myself the most noteworthy dip in production was seen in the last 25 games in the regular season or more specifically speaking post all-star break as curry in the last 25 games in the season was held to 23 points five Five assists, four and a half rebounds, turning the ball over two and a half times, but shooting splits of 42, 38, and 90 certainly isn't what we're accustomed to with Curry. To see that level of dip in regression in production is certainly concerning. Now, to be fair to Curry, I don't personally think that it's his fault. When you're 36, you're going to start to see some type of regression. So I don't even really blame Curry. I blame the roster construction of this team. As someone who's been critical of what this franchise has done post Kevin Durant era, I truly believe the Golden State Warriors front office screwed this man curry out of a competent roster this is an organization that had the opportunity to reconstruct this roster in the latter half of curry dre and clay's prime but instead what they decided to do was keep the draft picks draft young players and hope that it panned out and unfortunately it just didn't especially this season as you had to struggle immensely with the lack of talent on this roster having to rely on young inexperienced players like kaminga moses moody even as far as rookies such as b pods and tjd it certainly wasn't the greatest idea going into the season season, but that's honestly what they were left with by the end of the year. And yes, for the people out there who want to criticize Steve Kerr for not playing some of these young players earlier on, trust me, I believe it. I agree with you, especially when it comes to Kaminga, because it's crazy to me that he had Kaminga sitting on the bench in the beginning of the season. That was wild. That was crazy. Trust me when I say there were certainly games lost because of that. And in the Western Conference, where every single game matters, you want to be able to maximize who these players are. However, newsflash for a lot of Warrior fans who just want to put Steve Kerr underneath the bus. Sorry to tell you, dog. Those players were not really going to manifest anything in a postseason setting because of their inexperience. But honestly, I just cannot blame Steve Kerr. I put all the blame on Steve Kerr for not playing young players when effectively you're telling me that the best answer for a lot of the problems that the Warriors had was playing rookies in second and third year players. That does not make any sense at all. And so because of the lack of talent, Steph Curry had to do way more than he would normally have to do throughout the entire year. He just wasn't able to do it. It's something that needed to be addressed. And honestly, I just don't know what they're going to do moving forward because they had the opportunity to address this concern by going after talent but instead they decided to draft young players that turned out to be Kaminga, Wiseman, and Jordan Poole which just isn't suffice enough at all. So until they fix that problem there will forever be a ceiling on what this Warriors team is going to look like moving forward which is a huge reason why I believe that is the biggest problem with the Warriors. But after that there is another massive problem and it goes by the name of Draymond Green. Now as much as this may pain me especially because I don't believe that Draymond will be remembered as favorably as 
he should be. People don't thoroughly understand the essence and the impact that Draymond has on a night-to-night -night basis. But also, there is a lot of other impact that we have to talk about Draymond that has been completely negative, completely detrimental, from pushing Kevin Durant away from the team, knocking the talent out of Jordan Poole and effectively forcing them to trade him away, and even this year in particular, by removing himself from the lineup for basically a month and a half of basketball because he couldn't keep his hands to himself. Knocking out Yusuf Nurkic early this year and having that man Rudy Gobert in a chokehold. Uh, actually, shout out to Bearface. If you want to get your shirt, man, go check out the link in the description, man. All a whole bunch of crazy shirts out there. Go check them out. But Draymond being erratic, being someone you cannot trust, being someone who's been a detriment as impactful as he is on the floor, he has to be on the floor. And him missing that many games in a Western Conference where effectively standings and seedings was basically resulted into a difference of one or two games, only playing 55 games and forcing Steve Kerr and everybody else to pick up the slack and figure out what's the solution to the lack of defensive interior presence that we have is something that he has to hold with this team. And again, it's not just this season, him stepping on Sabonis last year, all of the techs that he picked up throughout the 2016 run. So by the time you got into the finals, one more tech meant that he was going to miss an entire game in the finals. All these are things that have negatively impacted what the Warriors result is going to look like by the end of the year. And that cannot be ignored. But of course, it doesn't stop there because you have the whole conversation with Andrew Wiggins and Klay Thompson. Now, when it comes to Wiggins, honestly, I don't know what happened. Two years ago, we're talking about an all-star, fringe all-star caliber player who was out there, one of the best best 3 and D options in the NBA, having a great POA, and someone who can effectively score points on the other side of the floor is something that everybody wants. It made sense for Wiggins to be a high commodity, especially after that postseason run where he had great moments defending Jason Tatum in the NBA Finals. After that run, a lot of people didn't really think it was that crazy. Bro, the fall off has been remarkable. It needs to be studied, my dog. You're, we're talking about a player who came in a league, didn't really meet expectations, went on a new team, exceeded them slightly especially because he had lower expectations and has now dipped back off to levels in which he has been effectively unplayable for many games throughout this year. So much so that he actually lost his starting position to Kaminga, which is scary because, again, this is somebody who was a high commodity less than 24 months ago. And unfortunately, because this is the first year of his new contract, the fact that he's going to be receiving around 25 to $30 million for the next three more seasons, and respectfully for a team that needs to maximize whatever is left of Steph Curry's prime, he's pointless. I, I just don't understand, at least on this team. He doesn't really make sense on this team at all. I'm gonna just be honest with you all. The thing that I have constantly talked about, regardless if it's on this channel or my main channel or my other channel, the elephant in the room is Klay Thompson. And I hate to do it, man. Klay Thompson and that run that he had with Steph Curry about five, seven years ago, bro, was magical. It made many people fall in love with the game of basketball. It introduced a style of play that really transcended, changes our perception of how basketball can be played and was genuinely speaking some of the most entertaining fun loving enjoyable basketball i have ever seen in my life but unfortunately brother you're washed you're done you're cut it's tough to admit but we have to have this heart of heart clay it's time to hang it up man your days as a starter that stuff is out the window this is by far your worst shooting season of your career the moments that you've had throughout this season was hard to watch you lost your starting position to b pods a rookie and you can't even say that you weren't given the opportunity to start you can't even say that no one entrusted you to do what needs to be done because they did they did and what's even worse is that when you were coming off the bench actually looked way better. It was some of the best basketball you've ever played all season long. In the last 28 games where half of these games you were coming off the bench, 19 points, 2 assists, 3 rebounds, shooting splits of 46, 42, 95 with you attempting 10 threes. But your minutes got cut down to 28 a game. That's you now. You played great. You were very productive. But you're just not a starter anymore. You're not providing the same value defensively. You can't create as much space that you used to. The shot isn't always there you're the definition of someone who should be coming off the bench and you know what that's oh Okay. But the reason why this is such an uncomfortable conversation is not just because this is somebody that we all at one time love to watch. Unless you're like a Houston Rocket fan, then at that point, I, hey, I, I get it. Maybe you may not enjoy them because the way that he was torching your team. Like, okay, C fan, I can see it. If you're a LeBron fan, I can see it because he definitely, you know, he had his moments against y'all. I can see that. But it's not just that. It's the uncomfortable conversation of finances. And that's where a lot of people are leaning towards that we possibly have seen the last game of the big three. 
three. Because as I've been telling you all year long, at the trade deadline, the conversation was, what exactly is this team going to do? What they're going to do with Klay Thompson? $43 million he made this year, but he's on an expiring contract. So then the question was, hey, are we actually going to bring back this player to this team? A player that will never, ever, ever be someone that we can consistently rely on anymore through any deep postseason run, especially for a team that needs another scorer, another creator, somebody that can alleviate a lot of that pressure off of Curry. Does it make sense for us to bring him back? And if we do, do we give him the loyalty contract? Do we give him that type of money just to show him like, hey man, we ride together, we die together. We win together, we lose together. I'm here with you thick and thin. Or do we have real conversations about where we are financially? For those who do not know, this is a team that has committed over $200 million. 200 M's. Next year, they already have $174 million committed, and both Moody and Kaminga have to receive their rookie extensions. Sure, Chris Paul, his money is not guaranteed completely, but you still want to juggle that money to go out there and get somebody else if necessary. So you might trade him for the 30 M, but whoever you receive back is also going to receive around 30 M's. This is a team that rolled the dice on a bunch of young players, and to be fair to them, Jordan Poole, he worked out in that one run back in 2022, won a championship, was really able to organize the offense looked great in the first round next year not so much and now this year in washington mm, ah Ooh, wow. James Wiseman might genuinely be the biggest bust that we've seen probably since either Ben Simmons or Anthony Bennett. We're talking about a top three draft pick that is unplayable for a Detroit Pistons team that was on a historically bad losing stretch. Ooh. And now you have to hope that a 21, 22 year old Kaminga, a 24, 25 year old rookie in TJD will see noticeable improvements and B-Pods can continue to grow in and emerge into a quality player within the next year or two. I'm here to tell you it's not happening. At the end of the day, this is a team that's going to have to overly depend on a 36, next year will be 37 year old, 6'3 guard. That's just, that's just not it. Bro, this Western Conference is vicious. It's treacherous. Steve Kerr could have played better lineups, better rotation, and played some of these young players earlier, but that still doesn't remove the fact that you don't have another second scoring option that's consistent. That still doesn't remove the fact that you already spent 200 million on this roster. That doesn't change the fact that Steph Curry next year will be 37 it doesn't change none of that. If you think that those young players are going to improve so much so that next season is going to make a noticeable difference while you commit even more money to this roster, congratulations, you played yourself. But if you want to accept the fact that it's over, it's done for, and just enjoy the rest of Curry, Clay, and Draymond, because I, that's what I'm going to do. And I will gracefully allow them to end that dynasty. But for you Warrior fans and everybody else who want to sit here and put crazy expectations on a team that doesn't have the talent to match it, you will continue to be disappointed every single year until 30 retires. But hey, man, it's been a great dynasty. I, I really thoroughly enjoy it, man. Uh, I think the dynasty is over. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. What do you think the Warriors should do moving forward? How do you feel about last night's game? And if you enjoy content like this, as always, hit the subscribe button, notification bell. If you want to watch games with me live, make sure you go to playback.tv backslash Lowe's Room. And if you want to cop some merch, link is in the description. Peace.